Hi, hello everyone, and welcome to Factory Berlin. My name is Graham Duplessis. I'm from the Factory Berlin team here, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our space, whether you're here in person or joining us online this evening. Um, tonight, of course, is our masterclass with Christian Linda from Airbus Biz Labs. Um, before I hand over to the man with the masterclass, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Factory Berlin, who we are, and what we do. Um, Factory Berlin is an innovation community of around 3,500 members. We bring together people from the startup, corporate, tech, creative communities around Berlin and bring them into our ecosystem to collaborate, to share knowledge and exchange ideas, build really cool businesses and products. Um, there are a few ways in which we do this. We have our programs. So for example, Stealth Mode, which is our female founders program. If you head to, our, head to our website, you can meet all the founders that are working as part of Stealth Mode at the moment. We also have our Artists in Residence program, 10 artists from around the world that are in Berlin now working on their projects. And we also have our Circles program, a really cool um, initiative we run where we bring together sub-communities inside our ecosystem around shared topics, uh, shared interests, and, and they exchange their ideas and thoughts on their topics. We also have a wonderful range of partners, for example, Google for Startups and Entrepreneur First, and they all come together in our community um, to empower our members with their resources and expertise. We also have events like tonight. Um, stay tuned, because next week we have another masterclass. Um, and in the end of November, we've got a wonderful fireside chat planned. So stay tuned to our events calendar, where you can stay updated on, on what's coming up next. Um, now, normally, if there was a room full of people here, um, we would do a little thing to get to know each other where we would introduce ourselves to the person sitting next to us. Of course, because we're keeping it safe and we're a hybrid event, we can't do that tonight. So if you're joining us online, please just drop a comment in the chat saying your name and what you do so we can all get to know each other in this virtual format. Um, also, after uh, Christian's presentation, we'll have a really nice Q&A session. So if a question arises during the presentation, feel free just to drop it in the chat at any point. And our glamorous event manager, Charlotte, uh, will come on stage and put that question to Christian. Thanks for listening to me, my housekeeping, my intro. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us tonight. Um, and without further ado, I hand over to Christian for our Corporate Venturing Masterclass. Hi. So many thanks, uh, Graham, for this nice introduction. Um, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, this evening, uh, joining the masterclass from the factory in Berlin. Um, I actually remember being there. It must have been uh, last year, some, sometime in the, in the fall as well. Uh, we were actually sitting or standing on that stage uh, there, uh, together with, uh, with Nico, uh, CEO of, uh, of the factory. And we were announcing the I think it must have been the blockchain uh, program we had running uh, back then from uh, with startups. So that's how how fast this world changes now. Now you can see um, my wonderful uh, office here. Uh, nothing fancy, not as fancy as, as Berlin. But um, also want to express my, my my gratitude and my thanks to the to the factory Berlin team making this possible. Um, I always love to be there when I'm in Berlin, connecting with the with the startups, with the community there, uh, with the corporates that are there. It's a fantastic place um, just to be, to connect, to to discuss, to talk, to be inspired. So um, you're doing a great job there, and I uh, hope to see you soon in person as well. So um, not much introduction uh, has done uh, because I I asked for it. So. Um, if you're looking here this evening, it's uh, that you want to learn something about corporate venture or you want to know something. I mean, it's a very young uh, field uh, still, and uh, I'm very happy to share my experience now being in this field almost 18 years now um, to not make the same mistakes I did uh, back then um, or, or to learn from, from, from the experience. I mean, we have tons out of it. We, we kind of know, we, we don't know what we what to do, but we certainly know what not to do. But um, what classifies me to, to stay here in front of you and uh, talking about, about corporate venturing? So who is this guy? Um, 
certainly a guy that looks better on PR photos than in real life. It's only one year, or it must have been two years in between of those uh, pictures, but a um, little bit of background story to, to where I come from, what I did. So um, the journey started in, um, basically I always uh, start the story from the beginning. Um, studied in, in Innsbruck, which is here behind uh, the Alps and Munich at the, at the moment. And uh, there was an opportunity to go abroad, um, studying in, in Barcelona back then. Um, so I kind of finished my studies. Whoever has visited Barcelona knows how hard uh, that can be. Barcelona is a fantastic um, city. Um, and as many of, of the people that went to, to study, I, I did not want to leave. Obviously, it's a fantastic, beautiful city with 360 days uh, of sun a uh, year. So this was back in 2009, 2010, and crisis in Spain, no job. So out of necessity, kind of, uh, I found this, the first company with uh, four of my, of my colleagues from university, and we did nothing else than import the electric bike motor of, uh, of, of a German company back then, demounted that and uh, build it cheaper and better to get cheaper and worse it together in Spain, Portugal, managed to create an electric bike um, company around it, the brand, managed to get funded. And three months later, we had to wind down the company, which was certainly the lowest point of my entrepreneurial career um, because we also had to lay off um, 70, 70 people. Um, nevertheless, the crisis in Spain and with three or four founders, we had, uh, we had uh, another idea to create an augmented reality application. And the use case was uh, fairly simple. This was 2009, 2010. You could point your device to Sagrada Familia, for example, and you would see how it was built up in augmented reality. You would get some information and a wonder. Uh, you would get 10% discount at Subway, Starbucks, and uh, Burger King at the corner. We managed to sell that company to Booking.com for a double digit million um, euros. So downs and ups, uh, all that in, in two years. Um, I then um, did a quick uh, pit stop in Switzerland, helped uh, create Swiss and UBS to build up their accelerators. FinTech was back then the, the, the big thing. Uh, obviously that didn't work out that, uh, that good. And I got the chance to return to Munich and uh, became director of Tech Founders, which is a white label um, accelerator, uh, starting back then with Siemens, BMW, Bosch, um, Unicredit, Adidas, a couple of uh, industry 4.0 champions in Germany uh, to kind of discover what can we do with startups, right? This was a very mystical uh, field back then for, star for, for corporates. So we started to dig uh, into that. Did that two and three, two and three years, and then I had the chance to join um, the first corporate accelerator ever in 2008. Telefonica's virus started to spread out over the world, over 16 accelerators uh, across the globe, uh, investing in far more than 1,000 startups, and I had the pleasure um, to run the Munich one and relaunching its initiative to a more corporate venturing um, vehicle, how to really work with startups in an effective way for, for a corporate, uh, starting 2017, um, was fun time, also made a lot of very good uh, uh, investments, a lot of them also failed, um, but uh, it was a fun time having an ecosystem uh, in the heart of Munich, and that's what uh, Factory Berlin always reminds me when I'm, when I'm there. So did that two, three years. Um, and then I actually had the chance um, to join Airbus um, out of a particular reason, um, actually, because when you, when you talk with, with corporates, um, CEOs and CTOs will always tell you um, how important innovation is for them and startups and whatsoever. As soon as the strategy changes, this is not a priority anymore. But there was one person at Airbus who really inspired me and, uh, and then really kind of acquired, uh, acquired me, um, the, the now CTO uh, of Airbus, uh, Grazia, um, whom I really believe and, uh, and now know um, that she's a true believer of innovation and the power of startups. So that was actually the, the starting point of, 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 of my career at Airbus and the Biz Labs. 
Um, I think there's much more to come um, in, the, in, the, in the next years, but some things um, I would not talk about today. Overall, um, I'm a very, a very um, happy, happy father of uh, two lovely girls. Uh, you might hear them now and then in the background. It's almost bedtime, bedtime uh, now. Um, but uh, I swear they're, they're, they're lovely. I was born in Brazil, grew up in Mexico, father is German, mother is Portuguese. I don't know, probably the best of a couple of, of worlds. I hope so. Um, so let's jump into the topic, right? Um, corporate venturing, corporates working with startups, startups with corporates, corporates building uh, ventures. Is this even possible? I'd like to tell a story with an anecdote, uh, with a picture um, my former mentor, Miguel, uh, introduced me to uh, when I was working at, uh, at Vira. And it's comparable with this picture, right? Um, it's the Industrial Revolution and when they, when they founded or invented uh, the steam machine. What they did is just pluck the steam machine in front of the old carriages, like, as you can see, see it here. Actually, there's, there's one saying with the innovators, if you ask the customers back then, um, what they would uh, want as, as a horse, they would just say faster horse, but not ever a steam machine. But that's a side. And that's how corporates kind of sometimes see the world um, of innovation. We just plug a great invention into our legacy systems and it will just take these, uh, scale this, uh, this, uh, this company up, right? But that's not how it works. Right? Innovation cannot just be connected with ex existing structures. And that's where a lot of people struggle with and struggle to understand. If you see the amounts of accelerators, incubators, venture builders, blah, 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 that got founded. Um, the last year, it's amazing. It's over two, 200 only in Germany uh, within the last uh, with last three years. Many of them without a mission, without a vision, um, without any purpose and just some consulting company telling them to, to do this. But the secret sauce, and this was my hard learning here, also running a couple of these corporate accelerators, was that no matter how fancy it is in the, in the front, no matter how, how fast it is, you really need to internally adapt into the systems. If you don't do that, no matter what happens, you're probably gonna end up like these guys because some of them will not survive. And this is also the case we see with all these fancy offices and uh, accelerators and labs. Uh, you see a lot of them in, in, in Berlin. A lot of them disappeared. Why? It's creating no impact uh, and, uh, and not serving the larger vision or mission um, of the company. So taking all that experience as a starting point to where I am today, um, what amazes me about Airbus leading aerospace of the company, uh, leading aerospace company of the world, um, is just the amount of scale things are. Like everything is big. The aircrafts are big, where they're built are big, um, their sites are big, um, and uh, also the bold and uh, the, the bold ambition is also big of this company, starting 50 years as a startup, um, almost to be a counterpart to what the USA was doing. So what you see here is a picture from the A380, which was uh, discontinued, but still having the ambition on, on building the biggest uh, commercial aircraft, is also something the company can, can be proud of and we are very proud of, and uh, not only this one. But coming back to the topic of innovation and technology, um, I see technologies as interfaces, right? If you have, the innovation ecosystem and you have a big company, then the technologies give you the interfaces where you have to interfere uh, from, the, from the outside. So working on those interfaces is key. Otherwise, uh, you end up like this guy here. Um, and if you don't let the, let the outer world uh, inside, you're not going to succeed here alone. So this is one of, the, one of the key learnings as well, that you have to create some kind of space that is open um, and uh, for people to enter, um, to, to, to exchange and to let them in. Actually, what we do with startups, so we take them from outside and bring them into this, into this ecosystem. But still, corporate venturing, being so young, 
it's constantly reinventing itself. And we as, as, as innovators also, if we stop doing that one day, um, we're not gonna succeed. Smart guy, Albert Einstein said this, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if we take every day like this, Actually, this is what a true innovator is. You always start to rethink, which is exhausting. You're constantly driving your brain. You're constantly changing with, with people. There's not a process that stays untouched within a couple of months. But that's how you have to move. You always have to be on the front runner and be defensive and proactive at the same time. And this is what we learn um, at our company to constantly keep evolving. Now, times at the moment are very harsh. Yes, but also a company that succeed in this perpetual reinventation will be the only one that will not end as the big examples of Kodak and, uh, and Nokia. We constantly have to move. And I can surely say that we are on the move. So that being said, um, what amazes me about, uh, about companies like Erebus is that it's the company of, of, of inventors, right? It's engineers. So brilliant engineers, brilliant innovations uh, come out of that because um, invention for, for some is nothing else than, than, than innovation. But what is different is that an innovation, an invention connected with execution, that for me is an innovation when you really drive the market and create market impact. So the question here is, and we always ask this ourselves, so what comes next, right? Constantly reinventing yourself um, corporate venturing will always be in the move in our company and hopefully also in the others because none uh, should stay um, the same. Beautiful this picture of, uh, of the Dragon SpaceX here um, to underline um, the mission. So quickly integrating sustainable and scalable new business potential into our company, having a positive impact in the world. Right? Let that sentence sink because there's a lot of interesting things in here. So innovation for me needs to be sustainable. I'm not talking about environmental sustainability, it might be, a, might be an element of that. But if innovation is not sustainable, it's just not, not, not gonna last. New business, so different opportunities. We're building aircraft today. So what, what other businesses, potentials um, do we see? And what we always have in the middle is what kind of positive impact we have in the world. 2019, um, every, every, every hour, 6 million people took off in one of our aircrafts. So I would say you can scale that to a number where you can say it has a positive impact or a negative um, in the, uh, on, the, on the world, but definitely not just a couple of customers, but many, many, many customers. So, Getting there um, is really not easy. And this is now where it gets complicated and has more the character of a, of a masterclass of, of, of what we can learn. So learnings from here, and I'm sure you can get the slides afterwards um, from, from the factory team. But what is, in, what is important here is that you have to play on different ends all the time. So it's not just that you tweak one thing and then go into one direction and you have a clear mission going there but you're constantly um, um, whooping up the, the, the hot potato, right? Um, because what we do is build businesses around and within our company, having the smoothest interfaces for startups to work with us. Now it's a huge, huge corporate. It's 130 plus thousand uh, employees and, uh, and, and mostly present in, in many countries of this, this world, but having the smooth interfaces for startups is something essential we need today to make it as easy as possible to adapt um, the technologies we, we, we do not want to do, we don't, we don't have to do, or we don't know how to do, right? Also getting the innovations from inside corporate founders. You once in a while will find the rare animal with an entrepreneurial uh, mindset finding yourself in a, in, a, in, a, in a big corporate. So extrapolating those people and really getting those ideas to business, those are probably gonna be the best and most uh, most exciting ideas, right? We also spend, uh, stand for, for work evolution. So the way we work, the way we are organized is very much different than, than a corporation is because a corporation is made to sustain 
and um, to to protect the core business, which is profitable today, which is logical. Um, we are thinking about what could come from outside. So the way we are organized needs to be very much, uh, very much different. Also a branding instrument, of course. I mean, innovation stars, that's also something where we are very exposed to the outer, outer market on, on what we do. There are a couple of units that are more in the, in, the, in the background and also being a market maker. So what kind of customers are we not serving today? What kind of markets are we not tackling today, which we could be tackling? So thinking very differently um, than, than the rest of the core, core company. Being on both angles of exploring the future and exploiting the present. And this is what I mean with simultaneous place as an open, as an open uh, interface. Now, how does that look like into, into, into detail? Times like these actually, um, individually, they're, they're hard. And on our society, they're very hard. And um, as an innovator, we would not be innovators if we would not see opportunities within this, right? So the world will drastically change um, as soon as recovery is there. Um, what is this world going to look like, right? So six months ago, we were thinking disruption would come from customers. Customers would, would, uh, would think differently. Uh, we saw it coming. Markets would probably change, and there would soon be some technologies that are game changers, quantum computing, blockchain, um, AI, you just name every buzzword uh, in there. They would, we thought these were, would be the things that would, would change us. Now, the disruption we're living at the moment is a much more severe one. It's a biology disruption, right? And this is something we probably did not see coming um, as this, that the world be, would be disrupted uh, in, this, in this manner. And we have to be prepared for that. Also, while as an innovation unit, we were doing things, exploring the future, we very fast went then to exploit, regroup, and reamount for the future. And that's also what an innovation unit needs to do in each company, right? We can move from doing fancy stuff to really supporting our core business, because that's our duty at the end for, for, for us all uh, um, investor. Now, the normal trajectory this uh, this disruption takes, and let's say in, in form of the startups, uh, in form of, of a startup, um, and how it works in us is that we identify maybe a startup with a promising technology um, out there. Now the the, the circles you see here are the deep systems. Whoever does B two B business knows that actually as a startup dealing with a corporate, it's hell. Right, uh, you have procurement, you have legal, you have IT. I just have to 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 mount up so many resources. As a startup, this is really happy. So, uh, this is really really hard to do so. So what we see ourselves as as this interface, getting the startup really quick into business, seeing if we can get to business, and then using our power of the name and the units to really extrapolate that to other business units. And if you win, the leading aerospace company of the of the world as a client, as a startup, um, this is a very, very uh, good thing to, to, to have. Again, here, putting the, putting the, um, the focus on explore, exploit, right? An ambidextrous organization, which is crucial. You can't do one or the other. So I borrowed this from Strategizer. Uh, you can find it in, in a great book. I recommend it to everybody. It's called uh, The Invincible Company by, by Osterwalder. They talk about this ambidextrous uh, organization, right? Explore, explore, uh, explore, exploiting uh, at the same time, uh, searching breakthrough technologies and finding innovations in efficiency and growth, right? Both focuses are very different. Um, uncertainty is very high when exploring, when you're testing out business model, and uh, it's very low when you're working on incremental stuff. Still, you have to do. Uh, both financial philosophy, the same culture and processes. Again, on Explore, you have a very different way of working where speed is king. Uh, you can fail. Uh, fail is absolutely in the game and part of the game. Um, what, is not, uh, what is not recommendable is to fail and not to learn. So these are two things you would always uh, hear within the innovators, like fail fast and fail a lot and I don't know what. Yes, all good, but learn from it. Otherwise, um, you're just going to be a complete failure then. Mm -hmm. And rapid adaptation of, uh, of new things. Um, 
so for different processes, you also need different people and, and skills, right? I mean, there's not just one cure um, for all. Um, you really need one that focuses on startups, one that focuses on internal innovation, a couple of others that are more uh, front-driven. So it's also very different from the people uh, we have and put in our team. I can say um, that, uh, that the teams are very uh, different and uh, different skills that are needed to explore everything. Um, but nevertheless, there's one thing you can learn, and this is, uh, this is inside here, um, what, we, what we learned from working with startups since now almost six or seven years. Um, there is a process you have to follow, right? First, get your stuff internally ready. Get those procurement uh, processes, those IT and legal processes that are fast for startups to, to get there. And then it's a process you can you can you, you can follow, right? Which doesn't change that much. It's all about discovering problem solution fit, product market fit, doing a first pilot uh, with the corporation, and then if you have that, that can be scaled to all of the customers of the corporation and to all of the customers um, of uh, of the supplier. But there's a process behind it. Everybody who just tells you, oh, we're just going to say what see what see what happens. Um, it will probably just not um, not not work. And then you can get to something which is adoption at scale, right? Because if you have to figure if you have figured this out once, um, the good thing in a big company, you're always going to find a lot of challenges. Challenges are endless in a big company, um, but you might also almost every time find a good startup out there that already has a technology out there and that wants to work with a big corporation. Right, because of their customer base, their brand, or their technologies. So there are some technologies that big corporates have that are very expensive for startups. On the other hand, corporates are very slow, startups are fast, right? There's a competitive advantage for it, and it can lead to considerable financial returns um, for both the startups and the corporate. Two incentives that also have to be very aligned um, to get there. And then you can get there, offering new new products to, to, to customers and or, or in our case, it's not the airlines, governments, or the end customer, uh, the passenger. But it's not only commercial aircraft, we also do defense and space, um, and we also have the helicopters uh, division within our um, company. In a nutshell, how do we do it, right? Using the global network we have to attract the best tech startups and bring them to scale through fast processes to really aligning those incentives if they win, we win, um, and having those processes in place to really get them uh, startups fast uh, in there. Wherever you are, right? We have a big presence in Europe, but uh, so we so in India, so in, uh, in Apex, so in Americas, so almost all of the uh, all around the world. And what I like most about about this job, what I'm really passionate, is that um, our ambition really is there, where the speed or the scope cannot be tackled by other teams, right? Where other people, uh, where other teams stop, this is where the innovation gang, the innovation team starts really to get those uh, those things out of the out of the mud. That's where we are, that's where we, we like to be, that's where we like to to have, to get our, our hands uh, dirty. So I talked a lot about the, the startup uh, part. Um, notion. Um, can also come from because um, it's not only from startups, from technologies, um, but also from markets and customers. So things um, we see and things where we see that we could create new opportunity, new growth engines for our company. Right? This was the big, uh, the big mis mistake you, you're always going to hear about Kodak and Nokia: um, failure for the diversification. Right? We might be very successful today. This doesn't mean that we're successful tomorrow. So identifying today how customers will look in the future, what they will want, and create those growth engines is our duty um, today. And then we can see those trends. We can put them all around the company, um, and we can scale them through, again, our customer base um, <clears throat> and uh, the brand we have. You're gonna find this in in the literature as often as venture building. Um, now at the moment there are a lot of venture builders, venture studios, venture company build. I don't know what um, it's it's a fancy thing to do, 
but it's actually an art to identify those topics, um, which you which could really be promising because they also have to fit in the context of your company. Is your company even able to do it? Do they have the right people, the right skills, the right uh, technology to do so? And then building and scaling new ventures is a very hard business and also involves a lot of investment. Um, where where one out of eight might uh, might make it to the to the market, but still here keeping to a process. Uh, you will find here um, and always adapting, always thinking um, how this could be better um, is a way to succeed there. Also here, uh, things change, but you can here see kind of how the, how the funnel um, is in a very general, general, general way. Now, when I'm a true believer of, um, of revenue generation through innovation, I said this at the very beginning, um, for me, innovation means taking an invention, combining it with uh, research and the development from the business perspective, and combining it with execution, the hardest part for, for, for large corporate. That for me is innovation, right? Hard cash, hard revenue. But there's more than that, right? So-called innovation ripple effect. Hard cash needs to be measured but the impact can be wider or more lasting because innovation within a big company can also serve as all the learnings we get from running an organization like no other part of the organization is run. Identifying future trends, we, we don't have the capacity to build businesses around all the future trends, <clears throat> but it gives us interesting learnings and, uh, and insights on it. Create a competitive advantage to other competitors and also a big sales sweetener um, as well, we saw this uh, also in the in the past, um, and this is actually a very a very good incentive for um, customers, airlines, governments, also taking taking solutions we have because um, not only we have the product, but we also have an innovation uh, unit and an innovation engine that is running. So uh, not many many companies of the of the world has such a such a good uh, working and and high running innovation unit as Airbus. Um, does and also institutional relations, right? Um, it's also a part we play in the society, we play within the countries. Um, we are learning again here um, from from especially this year. Um, we have to evolve more. We have to even think uh, think more on the future, how the world would look like today. And even if we get many setbacks um, the, this year and the, the upcoming years. What we do today, truly believe um, that we can change um, the history of the company by that changing also um, the society. And we want to contribute to um, this positive change of society of the of the world. So while a lot of innovators um, per se are, are a very impatient, me as well, a very impatient animal, um, for this year, we have learned to be patient, to think again, and to maximize our efforts uh, for the future. Apparently, what we have done in the, in the past, as innovators in general, is not enough. I truly believe we can, we can do more. Coming back to, to innovators um, or, or corporate venture masterclass as well. We had startups, we had venture building, we had uh, the ripple effect. At the end, you said this a couple of times, you cannot do just only one thing, um, right? You have to have a portfolio of um, innovations that have a fast impact to market, that are big, that are small, combining that and pacing them, and also, and, and also getting them to the resources that you can, that you can manage, uh, manage them at the same time. So actually juggling these hot potatoes, as I said at the beginning, is a secret on maintaining a portfolio that constantly creates impact, right? And you have to count it, you have to measure it. Um, and at some point, and this is what I like about, about corporates, um, is that the wave builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up. And then if it breaks, it really breaks with a lot of, with a lot of impact and all this uh, power of the, of the corporation gets, uh, gets unleashed. But you have to maintain, build that portfolio and many of, 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 of a couple small success stories build upon that. Also the communication within the company and outside of the company, therefore is very, very, um, very important. Now here again, uh, learning, whoever says um, consulting companies or, or, or you see this a lot in, in 
I don't want to want to want to be the devil for consulting companies. They do a great, great job. But you're going to find this in literature um, a lot um, that innovation cannot be measured if you don't do it. Kodak, Nokia, whatsoever. It's all crap. Um, you can measure innovation, right? There's just a couple of KPIs here you can you can measure, and I can give you 500 more. Right? You just have to define which ones are the right ones for your company, which ones are the right ones for your vehicle, and why do you want to measure them, right? Everything has a reason. If you want to do it for marketing purposes, go ahead. Might not be an impact, uh, but you can do it as well. If you really want to create impact, build great companies, uh, and be the next growth engine of your company as well. Build it up, be patient, and uh, and measure it. And uh, for us, I can say we have a clear route um, to go. Uh, we have a clear ambition, um, but the biggest thing is that uh, that we believe. And uh, 30 minutes are up. Um, I'm amazed uh, about the accuracy um, of today, um, ending this session with what we really believe in and um, kind of why I wake up every, every, um, every morning. And I talked about the, the, the children I have because I truly believe that we can create a better world um, for the future of our children. And, uh, this is the latest ambition of, uh, of Airbus, Zero E, flying uh, emissionless in 2035, uh, which is a long way, way to go. But for us innovators, there's a lot of technologies being developed onto that. And I think waking up for this, uh, creating a better future for us, for the, for the society and where we live in. And uh, we all love to travel. We all love to connect. Um, we all love to see see different things. Uh, this is not a, a structural problem. Um, this is where we where we up to. So in that sense, many thanks for having the patience to listen to me. Um, if you want to connect on on LinkedIn, this is the QR code. Um, this is my Twitter on LinkedIn. Whatsoever, I'm open, always open for a chat and uh, happy to learn from you. Happy to hear from you and uh, here to serve. Many thanks. Thanks for the applause. Yeah. I really missed that. Isn't it so exciting to have like a mix of at home, in person? It's always really fun. Actually, it is. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is very, very, very interesting. So kudos to to this. Uh, I really like this hybrid format. Yeah, great. And we have um we have a couple of questions from you, but I just want to remind everyone watching online that there is still an opportunity. We still have time. We still have twenty minutes. So please send your questions. Um, so that we can ask them to Christian. Um, let me just open up. We have a couple here. Okay. Um, is there a difference in how you collaborate with an external startup or an entre entrepreneur project? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The the difference is uh, is huge. Um, normally, it uh, it starts with the maturity. So. We changed from working with very early stage uh, startups to more mature ones, those that already have an experience of working with a corporate on B2B. So the maturity level is something that is certainly certainly very different um, because the startup already has a running business, has a running technology. Um, so that would be the starting point. It has a team, it has an ambitious, it has a very, very different incentives. Now working with entrepreneurs, um, you kind of, you can try to replicate uh, this in a certain way, but I believe that what really drives a successful startup is also a hungry belly, right? If you have the right incentives um, to go for it and either you deliver or you don't get the next funding round, uh, this is something we're trying to replicate uh, within, within our company. Scarce resources, that is what really makes it happen. There are certain things you can, you can, you can, uh, you can learn, like business modeling, testing, hypothesis and everything, but at the end, I truly believe that it's the hungry belly uh, that makes this successful. But then also giving the entrepreneur the chance to leave and succeed um, with this company outside of the company. If this company takes off outside of our, our premises, then I truly believe we have done a great job. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then the next question. Um, so, um, sorry. I need to turn up the brightness on my laptop. <laughs> um, so, how do you ensure that um, how do you ensure that projects from that come from an innovation arm continue to thrive and be part of the core of the company? That's a good question. Uh, that's something um, 
discovered the last year is that we were always trying to do something outside of the core, being disruptive, being fancy in, in different, uh, in different uh, cities than, than the mother company. That's actually where we failed. Um, we really then had the first successes is taking our internal customers, the business units, on the journey from the beginning and getting the buy-in from the beginning and also letting them pay for parts of the project. So there are a lot of innovation units that act like internal NGOs that will say, hey, I have money. Um, I can pay you this startup collaboration whatsoever, but if they don't put skin in the game, um, you're not going to succeed. So taking the internal customer, the business unit, on this journey from the beginning and uh, making them put skin in the game. If you have those two things, and sometimes it's easier to get to than, than just asking, um, you're truly going to gonna, gonna succeed. So do it in co-creation rather um, than doing it outside of the company because the corporate antibody will always reject innovation from outside, right? So you have to do it kind of with the internal customer who at the end is also paying the rent. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And um, next question, at the end of a cohort with Airbus BizLab, how do you evaluate your success? What are the KPIs? Mm -hmm. So the ultimate KPI is, uh, the, the ultimate KPI is revenue, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, at the end, how much, uh, deals that the startup sign with big Airbus, right? Um, as, I, as I said in the presentation, the success of the startup is our success because if we see our business units paying for the startup solution, it's something they really want, it's something that they really need, right? The business unit does their business case. They have the, they have the possibility to either acquire something from a, from, a, from a normal supplier or from the startup. If they buy it from the startup, for us, this is a great job. And if the startup gets revenue, this is also a great job. We also try to measure like at the end, how much revenue this creates for us or how much savings. At the end, it is possible. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a long way to get there, but uh, the short-term objective is aligned with the startups one, uh, is to create revenue um, for them. Perfect, thank you. And then um, next question, how do you handle the friction that occurs entering a partnership with a startup? I think it's a lot about, um, can repeat it again, aligned incentives and the team that works on this, right? You need some kind of understanding on what a startup actually is, right? Uh, if, a, if a corporate uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't answer within two to three months, this might be normal in a corporate environment. Uh, it might also mean that if you do this to a startup, it might not exist any, anymore. Payment structures of 90 days are just not possible for a startup. It has to make money. So I think it's a lot of our team as well to understand that and to evangelize this to a big corporation. As soon as they, the, the people there understand that, they're more than helpful and they're more than supportive to, to do that. I mean, there's not a good and bad between what kind of job you, you, you choose. There's reason um, for, uh, for both of, of it. But again, here, um, evangelizing, communicating a lot around it and having this buffer zone between startups and uh, the big company is, is our job. Sometimes we, we act as a translator, right? Mm -hmm. um, talking very two different uh, languages and uh, bringing two different cultures um, together. And uh, that's where, where a lot of the, the, the big companies do not succeed. So there's endless bash bashing about this, about big corporates and working with startups. But on the other hand, also, I've seen tons of startups that do um, some kind of event pitch or, or a stage pitch to, to, to corporates, which is also not the right, uh, the right approach to do so. So if you are a startup, you also level up on the B2B game uh, because it's a very different game uh, than going to Web Summit or to Slush and pitching in front of an, an audience. If you really want to get the big bus, bucks and, uh, and be a major supplier of this uh, big company, you also have to learn that. And that is also our, um, our ambition and our mission um, to teach startups, especially in B2B sales, how to do that. Perfect. And what stage, what growth stage are startups generally in that you take interest in? So it gets interesting when a startup has first customers, first revenues, and maybe one of the first rounds out of a seed stage. So naturally, we're looking at startups that are depending on the geography, a good European pre-series A, 
ground, right? Because that's when you have built up a team, that's where you have a good business developer, that's where you have also security processes in, in place where you can work with a big uh, corporate and uh, the startup will not go bust after two or three months and uh, they will not do this accelerator uh, safari uh, many, many are doing. So we need some kind of stability working with the startup um, that we really can align those, uh, those, two, those two incentives. Perfect. And then you briefly um, touched on how you streamline acquisition processes and so on, how you get startups involved in the first place, but how are you like eliminating, how are you like, again, removing the friction between a corporate and startup environment once they're, once they're on board? Like what are the key stages that you're um, developing processes mm -hmm. to make it smoother? Yeah. So uh, well, well, the first part is, is a lot about getting to know each other, right? These two different cultures and really understanding that and translating that. And the second one would then be clearly aligning on, on, on milestones. So what do we expect out of a proof of concept? Um, we don't see a proof of concept as a success. Uh, we see a success if they get a follow-up project. So we, so we always work on, on that. So we put one of our team members um, as part of their business development team to phrase through this big company and get the big deals uh, on, on, uh, on them. I mean, with all the bureaucracy, with all the processes, with all the formal and informal networks, that are within the big company. A company, big company is like a, like a world of its, of its own. Um, you really need somebody who takes you by the hand and gets you through that. Otherwise, I mean, startups, B2B, you know it. Um, trying to cold email somebody or hunt somebody down on LinkedIn, this would just take too long, right? So I believe that every big corporation needs something that, uh, that, that we have that is kind of like a venture client unit. We secure um, the startup winning uh, the big corporate as a client. Perfect. And then um, another question: How do you ensure? How do you how do you ensure that you have enough ideas or startups in your funnel? I mean, finding startups nowadays is not hard, uh, right? Uh, so you can find them everywhere. Um, finding the good ones, it is right. And um, this also changed, and there's also a lot of learning in in this because. Uh, let's say in the good old days, 2015, we were running from Web Summit to Slash to what's there. It was a fun time um, talking with a bunch of startups. But then we quickly realized that actually if you're a real good startup and you're ambitious, you're not going to spend time on those events, right? You're going to be at home working on your product and closing closing customers. So in that time, we still built our data platforms ourselves that used to look on social media, where are the hot startups? Um, all the things we have today, like Kunda Siena and all those blogs you're gonna find, they were not existent and there. So we build up our own platforms. Luckily nowadays, you're gonna have fantastic platforms like Crunchbase, like CD Insights, Pitchbook, Traction, you name it. And that's where you can download all the, all the teams, all the descriptions, all the emails. Um, and then we do a good selection and in the short, a list of the of the most promising startups and then we have a personal contact with them right because that's what we also learned if you get that first step right probably the relationship and it's all about relationship here in this uh in this uh, business um is uh, we're starting with the right foot so as i said identifying the right startups is not hard, not uh, identifying startups is not hard getting the right ones you really need somebody that has the experience and has served also both, uh, both ways. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then uh, one last call out online to questions. Um, I'll give a second, otherwise we have, I think a, a simple one to close on, which is um, how do we get connected with Airbus BizLab? <laughs> Keep it simple, tell us what's the, what's the call to action to? <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the simple one is uh, to just write me on, on LinkedIn, right? I, I know the, the right uh, person to, to talk to. You're going to see who's in the team. Um, that was what's, what's, what always works uh, works the best. Otherwise, if you're in Madrid, Toulouse, Hamburg, uh, Bangalore, or the UK, uh, we have offices uh, in, in place in all of the cities you might know them, uh, because they're small ecosystems uh, as well. We, we actually also have a Hauptstadt representants. In, uh, in Berlin, uh, but they're not the startup guys. 
Um, but I think the easiest way is uh, social media. This is, this is how we do. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, Thank you. Yeah, this was a really insightful talk, and it was really interesting to learn how you balance um, and how you manage relationships with startups versus entrepreneurs and so on. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Um, and thank you so much for joining us online or in person. Um, please check out our events calendar to see the next things happening. Um, and thank you all so much. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Stay tuned. Bye.